I'm recording. Okay, so if we start this class off, let's, um, the Bible starts off, I mean, not the Bible, this book of Revelation being so unique, and that's why we're studying the book of Revelation. We're not going through uh, every different creature and all the different things that's nature, that we're not going to do that, but we wanted to study the history of the book of Revelation. I think you're going to learn a lot by studying the history. Once we understand, once you get through this class, you'll be uh, definitely, uh, feel like that you have the right information now to understand the book of Revelation. And many times that's what happened. People jump in the book of Revelation, haven't did any historical study at all, haven't done no background study, don't know the date, don't know who who's really being talked to, don't know why God chose John. They didn't, they didn't ask no important questions. They just try to break down, you know, who this animal is, what it means, and think it's nature without doing any background study. You wouldn't get into a relationship like that. You get into a relationship trying to find out something about who you who you smile on that you want to get to know who they are by looking at where they've been you know what happened to your last mate you know nature you know why ain't you in that relationship now you start asking all them hard questions well likewise to come down to god's word historical study needs to be at the top of the list we really need to start off with a good historical study so the, this book being unique as it is we uh we shared with you that it starts off and ends up with two things a blessing and a curse does anyone can anyone quote what that curse is what's the curse in the book of revelation yes sister uh, pastor wanda good evening yes oh. okay good evening Bless you. What were well, you going to answer the question? Bless it. What 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 is the curse in the Book of Revelation? Anybody? Doctor Short, I think it's a uh, uh, adding to the word and taking away from the word. There you go. And it says this book. So this is that curse is specifically aimed at adding and taking away from the Book of Revelation. No other book that God, no no no. Uh, uh, Paul's letters, none of John's letters, none of Peter's letters, st start telling how blessed you're going to be and how cursed you'll be if you add to any of these letters. Paul never went there to said, if you change my letters, I think of this nature, then you will be cursed. But now I want you to think about something. Okay, we got to put uh, some on me here. Okay. Um, now, when you think about these letters, now, Paul was in a type of jail. He was on the Isle of Patmos. And the Isle of Patmos was kind of uh, like a jail-like place for what kind of people? Did anybody run across that? What kind of people are more likely on the Isle of Patmos? Were the murderer thieves, politicians, people that came up against the, the Caesar? Or what type of people are probably um, on the Isle of Patmos? Anyone? Nobody ran across that. Okay, people. Now this needs being your notes because nobody know it. Uh, the people that more than likely were on our patterns was political people. Political people, more than likely. Now, wow. take, now take note of something. Lord. If they wanted to kill you because of something you really did bad, they would have killed you. But the fact that they put you on the our patterns says they really weren't trying to kill you. They just want to get rid of you. They want to get rid of opposition. They want to get rid of people that's coming up against what they're saying. They're not trying to kill you at this point. Okay, so hold on. Uh, they're not trying to kill Dr. you. Dr. Short, why would they permit that? That again? I, I was just going to ask a question. Uh, why was it political people that only put them on the Isle of Papas? Uh, well, the majority, they weren't just political people, but the majority uh -huh. of them were political people based off of what uh, my research was. Majority of them were political, and that's uh -huh. more than likely people that came up against the Caesar, people that uh, that didn't like what he was doing or saying this nature. Uh, and, and they were probably well-known people, but you don't kill people like that. Uh, you don't because you make martyrs out of them. So you, the, the wise thing, and you look at some of your great leaders today, not great, notorious leaders today, they don't, um, they don't necessarily um, 
uh, uh, kill their enemies, even though it's like Russia tries to poison them, gas them, and all that. But most of the time, they put them in jail. I grant you, Russia has several people that's in jail. A lot of your other countries, they more likely arrest them and put them in jail. They don't kill them. They put them in jail because they, if you kill them, you make them a monster and give the people a real reason now to, uh, to, uh, to uproar and to fight. Has any, am, I, am I saying something wrong? Has anyone noticed that, that many times that they arrest them and put them in jail? Because you don't want to make them a martyr. If you kill somebody, you make them a martyr. Look what happened to Jesus. Again, he, he was doing okay with his three and a half years, but his popularity and all really took off once he was martyred, once he was killed. That's when it takes off. And this is the same fact of life today. Once a person is killed, again, you take, I look, in, I look at our black kids and look at the, the men and the women that's been killed in the last year or so. When they died, nobody knew them until they died. Nobody was marching on the street for those guys. That, nobody really cared. But when something about death that makes you greater known, Michael Jackson raised more money dead than he ever did alive. So you'll find that something about they, they, they were smart enough not to kill John. Okay, so now let's go into our Bibles. I, I, I get your Bibles out because the Bible is the only book that we're using. Now let's go into the first chapter of the book of Revelation. Now, in your Bibles, does anyone have in your Bibles, where your Bible starts off the book of Revelation by just giving information. It just tells you a little bit about your book. Does anyone have anything other than just a plain Jane Bible that just don't really give you nothing? Does anyone have a, a Bible? That means you got a Thompson, you got a Schofield, you got uh, what I have here, one of my Bibles that is called the Archaeological Study Bible, and it has tons of information. Yes, my Bible um, has information in front of it. It's the um, it has the vital status, and it it gives a whole like storyline, the author, the original audience, the date, the setting, mm -hmm. the key verses, the key people, um, the special features, the blueprint, mm. all of that at the front. Awesome. Of it. So again, studying the book of Revelation or studying any book, matter of fact, starts off with a good Bible. You have to have a Dake, a Schofield, a Thompson chain, or, or archaeological, or my archaeological Bible is, excuse my slang, it's the bomb. I mean, I, it, it's breaking down pottery, you know, what, 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 uh, the symbols on top of pottery, archaeological findings, what they done dug up. Uh, and so the archaeological Bible is a book that you, that's, that's a must have. Dake is another. Thompson Chain Schofield is okay. They're good to have. They're, they're be, uh, but you're going to have to put $30, $40, $50, 60 into a good study Bible. You, you really, really want that. Okay, so that's what I, that's why one of the reasons why I wanted you to open up your Bibles. Because if, 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 if your Bible is not giving you a, a bits of information from the beginning, it's just telling you to read and not give you much to study with. It's just a reading book, not a study book. So what you want is a study book. Okay, now, so when we look at chapter two and chapter three, what separates chapter two from chapter three? Mm -hmm. Look at it, look, look at chapter two, look at chapter three. No, excuse me, I said that wrong, I do apologize. Let me take that back. What separates chapter two and three from chapter four? What's the difference? Look at chapter two. Look red at chapter green. three. Everything's in red. Yeah. Well, but they're also talking about the churches in two and three. Mm -hmm. uh, what I mean by talking about the churches is just telling us about, you know, the different names of the churches. In four, it starts a whole new thing. And, and like the top of mind say, the scene in heaven. Okay. 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 Um, very good. Um, so tomorrow I, I, I can hear you talk, but I couldn't hear what you were saying. What did you say? Mm -hmm. it's just the top of four says the message is the message for the church. The message for the church. Okay, but still, what's the separation between verse uh, chapter two and three and four? Something's different has taken place already with John. Something different has taken place, and it's in the first verse, the first three verses of the of uh, each one of those chapters. 
is talking about heaven. He's, he's talking about, even in the first chapter. After these things, I looked up and behold. Talking about the throne. Heaven. No, no, that, 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 excuse me, uh, 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 Apostle, you're reading, I'm um, talking. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I thought I was muted, I apologize. Okay, okay, so, no, the, the biggest difference is chapter two and chapter three is the only book, and, and you can, uh, one, chapter one is actually opening up, but chapter two and chapter three is, is where Paul is, is taking dictation. Chapter four now is the beginning of the visions. That church said Paul was taking dictation. No, excuse me, I said Paul John. Excuse me, John. So look, look at chapter four. What does cha read cha the beginning of chapter four? Do you want me to read the Somebody read out loud, please. Somebody read it out loud, please. May I read it? Yes. This Bible. After these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which I heard like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me said, come up here. I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. You want me to keep going? No, you stop right there. Now let's go to chapter two. Read a few verses as chapter two and maybe a few verses of chapter three so we can really see the difference. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand and who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Okay, stop, stop right there. That was chapter two. Uh, now, so we start at chapter two and he starts off saying, right, John is right now, uh, he's, he's pretty much taking dictation and he's taking mm -hmm. dictation on these seven churches uh, from chapter two to chapter three. Uh, you, you, you're looking at the to the church of uh, Pergamos, uh, the church of Smyrna. He says, Smyrna, right, Pergamos, right. To the, the church in uh, Thyrus, right. Uh, Philadelphia, right. Sardis, right. All this is dictation. Mm -hmm. But when we get to chapter four, John says, now he's starting to see vision. He said uh, he was in the spirit now. Uh, God is God is revealing to him a different way. It, it would you would think that why didn't God just instead of showing him these beasts and showing him books and, and all this, why didn't God just talk to him? But here uh, we look at this. God shows a different media through dreams and vision. Well, visions that He showed John. So that tells me, I, I'm thinking this is me thinking that God trusted John's interpretation of what He's getting ready to see. Anyone question, comment, or statement? Anyone, question, comment, or statement? God trusting John. God could have easily dictated the whole thing to him. Um, let me, I'm going to turn somebody. But, okay. Okay. So God, I okay, trusted John to have, uh, to be not only the, the ability to interpret it, but he got in the spirit. John said, I immediately, I, I, I was in the spirit. And so God did not give him a vision unless he was in the spirit. Because without being in the spirit, he probably would not got the right interpretation. And this is, and I believe, as we are prophets and uh, this nature, when we are operating in a high level in the anointing, we need to make sure we're in the spirit and not in the flesh. John immediately went into the spirit first. Question, comment, or statement? Anyone else see anything they want to share? I like that word immediately, though. Immediately, I was in the spirit. That's 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 what God, that's when God is totally 
and control. He it, he didn't go to no music. There was no singing. There was no dancing. You know, a lot of times when we get a spirit because we don't heard a favorite song. You know, maybe our favorite preacher to preach. But John didn't get a sermon. He didn't. There was no hymns. There was no uh no no mass choir singing. You know, there wasn't none of that. John P. Key, my boy, uh, singing it like that. It's um it's almost like he just standing there and went in the spirit. I mean, saints of God, I, I tell you, uh, and I'm not going to try to, let me slow down a little bit and not be preachy, but that's a, that, that's amazing to me that you can be standing still and the Spirit of God come upon you like that. Just comes upon you like that. That's not something that happens all the time to everybody, but it happened to John. The Spirit of God immediately came upon him and God began to show him and told him to write. Uh, what he pretty much what he's seen. God trusted his revelation and trusted his interpretation of what he's seen. Now, but let's back up a little bit about these seven churches. Were these seven churches or were these representatives? They weren't really seven churches. They were just representative of, uh, of people in different places. What did you guys find out in your studies, in your homework? Were these uh, 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 real churches or were they representatives you know we they call us the church you know so we are the church but were these real churches were they real places were they real buildings well i i looked into it and i feel like that we are the church and he was talking to us as individuals and as i was going through the churches um i was trying to identify exactly what type of churches or people he was talking to and in the first part of revelations um Two, one through seven, I feel as though he was talking to the leaders, to the apostles or leaders of the congregation on what they needed to do. And I kind of try to figure out what the first work was. It was come back to your first love, repent and do the first works. Um, but looking at several videos, some of the first works people would say was healing, going out preaching and healing because that's what Jesus sent them out to do first was preach the word and heal the sick and um, raise the dead. But listening to the video from Dr. Short class, the first words is sanctification and salvation. And it just took me back to when Jesus first got baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. He, he was drawn to the wilderness. He was separated from to be tempted. So um, looking at the Smyrna church, it seemed as though he was talking to people that was going through a lot of trapping tri tribulations and poverty um, and imprisonment, but he was encouraging them to stay strong. That though some of them were poor, they were rich because they were rich in spirit, rich in knowledge, and they were there to help. Uh, uh, Sister Myra, Sister Myra, hold on for a second because uh, I want to make it clear because mm -hmm. one moment you, you, you kind of said that you thought that it, that we are the church and God is kind of talking to us, but yes. um, but what you're saying now is almost like He was talking to you know people that was going through. So I want to be clear: was yes. God talking to the 21st century or was He talking to the first century? <laughs> We're in the 21st century, but when God showed John and talked about those seven churches, that was the first century. Yes. We're in the 21st century. Was that prophecy for the 21st century or was that prophecy for the first century? That's what I want everybody to tell me. Was I, it for the first? I, I think it was for both, both. Dr. Shea. Yeah, it's, it's for both of us. Mm -hmm. always, it's, it's always alive after spoken. Okay. Anyone else? I think it was uh, the first century. Okay. Pastor, anyone I, else? I believe uh, it was for the first century and for us because we're talking about in time. Mm. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now we're right now we're, we're just talking about uh, the letters that was addressed to the seven churches. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when God said told him to write, was he, was was John considering the twenty first century, or was he considering those seven churches? Was he considering anything outside that? Was he told to consider uh, anything outside that at this time? No. Well, Doctor no. Short, he was talking to the body of Christ. And 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 mm -hmm. I believe I don't see where he was told that he told us, but I believe he was talking to both because the same thing that went on then is going on now. Yeah, you can you can say the same thing's going in, but actually, but 
but the question is, who was God telling John to write to? Did he tell John to write this for, for the first century and the churches to come? Or did, was, he, was he told him to write to the churches that are and that is? To both. <laughs> well, from a reading that I read that starting at number four, chapter four is where everything is for the now, but everything before chapter four was for the past. Yes, that, you're not going to find no credible theologian to tell you that that le that the beginning of that letter to the seven churches, even though they remind of a, remind of, of ourselves and all that, and that's fine and dandy, but those letters were meant for those churches. And, and uh, now let's think about this: before those letters were written, I did this last week. I already established last week that those churches already existed. Remember, Paul talked about the uh, uh, the Corinthian church. He talked uh, uh, then, and Paul talked about the church at, at, uh, at uh, the, Gal the Galilean church. And so we, we also read Jude. Jude was talking about the problems that was going on in the church. So there was a multiple, a lot of problems going on at the church at that time. Yet we can look at it and, and see... Uh, resemblance of today but we can, but the, remember one thing that i've learned and again and i talked about and i addressed it early in the study the bible says be careful not to add to and take away mm -hmm. yes there's some stuff in the book of revelation but we can't just take stuff because it looked like it fit here like it's a puzzle that's not good theology good theology is doing your historical study doing your dates and times so let's talk about why we know that paul was writing to the seven churches first we know that they were writing to those seven churches because because of historical studies and because of the early church fathers we know that those churches definitely did exist and those churches were in some serious trouble now one of the things that i need you to do a little bit more on this week write this down i really need you to do a good study on these seven churches because there's no point in going to into uh to the visions unless we understand the church because it's all about the churches even though there are some things that is it that it is in the future because revelation is past present and future but god was dealing uh, with john all about the churches it was pretty much about the churches uh, at this time and uh now there's one scripture that says everything that was written a fourth time or written for our learning that through praise of the scripture we might have hope now god expects us to learn from the past but that because he expects us to learn from the past that does not, does not mean that he was writing to us he expects us to learn from other people's mistakes he expects us to learn from uh the good the bad the other we learn from that but that does not mean because we're learning from them that god was actually talking to us but again now when it comes down to those seven churches did anybody find out where are those ch churches uh as those churches exist today where would they be located at uh turkey asia yeah, right yeah. very good uh very good uh reverend rose they would be in west turkey if they existed today they would be in, in west turkey uh now um now, why do you think, again, I brought this up last week, why do you think that God chose John to be an apostle, uh, to, to be the one that to write to these seven churches? Well, last week he told us he was gifted. <laughs> right, he, he was gifted? He was gifted how? Um, that he could... Uh, uh, Understand. Um, uh, uh, I gotta go back to my notes. That he was gifted. He was able to receive, recall, understand, and write. Yeah, and, and, and right. that's okay. crucial. That's <laughs> crucial to, to have the ability to properly understand. And that's where I want you guys going to tell you something. Many times people say, I want God to use you, but God cannot use you no greater than your comprehension and your understanding. You will not go far. I don't care how much you say you love him, how much you want to do. Uh, if he can't trust you with his word because he warns, don't add to or take away. And people do that all the time, preaching God's word, saying stuff that that's not true. 
and I'm and I'm and I'm I really want to be careful as I teach this. I, I'm making sure that I don't make no errors. This book is that important to God that this starts off with a blessing and a curse. No other book has that. So we should enter into this study with reverence. We're not playing. We want to make sure. Uh, I'm not going to open my mouth unless I'm 100% sure. Uh, if I take it's my opinion, it's my opinion. And God knows it's just my opinion I'm thinking. But again, let's reverence the word of God. Okay, but I, I enjoyed everything everybody's saying, and, and, and I want you to speak what, what you feel and think of nature. But again, this is why we're doing this type of study. We're not going to go through, you know, like most of the time people study the book of Revelation. Most of them couldn't tell you uh, why John was on the Isle of Patmos. Now we pretty much know that's what it's saying. Any political uh, rivalry, anybody that comes up against the Caesars, that's where they pretty much put you without making you a martyr. And so, but we did ask the question, did at any time, did that stop John from preaching? When John came off the Isle of Patmos, did he ever preach again? Oh, yeah. I'm sure he did. Yes, he did. Yes. He preached yes, again. Yes, he did. So, yes. Now, so after they get sick and tired of him preaching, what did they try to do to him to stop him from preaching? Okay. What did they try to do to John to stop him from preaching? They tried to kill him. How? Um. No. This is after he was boiled in the oil, Nola. No, that that is it. The boil the oil. The boil the oil don't kill you. Ain't too much else gonna well. I, I, I would, I would love for someone to show me that. All, all the thing that I tried to find that on, I honestly couldn't find nowhere where. In scripture, it talked about no, John. No, we, no, we didn't. No, it wasn't in scripture. Just like, and again, uh, most of the apostles that died, we know how they died, right? We know some was hung upside down. But guess what? It don't tell you that in the Bible. How do you know that then? You know that because of historical writings. That's how we know how John uh, died, because of historical writing. It don't tell you how Thomas died. It don't tell you how uh, uh, Malafu died. It don't tell you how uh, uh, Peter died and some of the others died. You know how they died because of history. This is how we know how that, that John was boiled because of historical writers. We trust the historical writers, the fathers of, that's why we had that course, Understanding Church History. The church history broke down the writings of the early church fathers. And the early church fathers told us that they witnessed John being boiled, but yet he still lived. So we're, talk, we're looking at witnesses, people that witnessed that. Matter of fact, Elder Dino, I think it was you that mentioned about the boil last week. I uh, brought that up. Did you hear that, or um, am I wrong? No, that's no. Um, I went through and I uh, researched it through various Bibles and commentaries. Um, it, it talked about how every one of uh, the apostles met their death, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, that's what I read about it from right, the historical okay. writer. Amen. Okay, so you uh, in in your reading, they mentioned about his boiling. Yes. Right. So yes. I'm saying so. It's just depending on, I'm not trying to argue. I'm just trying to get an understanding because um, of the books that I read, talking about the apostles' death and everything that I looked up. Uh, it, it was like it was a false saying. It was a false teaching. The same thing about the prophecy that you asked us uh, to look up where uh, it was prophesied that John wouldn't die at that particular time. Well, when I looked all that up, it wasn't a prophecy in the scripture for John. That was not what Jesus said. So I, I, guess don't, I don't know what site you be looking at. So this is why I said when you send in your homework, you have to send in your references because even though you say that I stuff, I, I need to be able to see your references from your homework. I did. When I sent in my homework, I sent in where I, where I saw some of this stuff at. I really okay. did, and, and okay. it was in books that I have. No, because I don't go online that much. I don't, I don't I deal with it. But yeah, but see, that's well, that's an issue because I can't read your book. Because every book, where I got books on the book of Daniel that I threw in the trash because somebody write it, they don't make them a, 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 a what have you. But what I'm, I'm telling you though, to that. Mm -hmm. But, but most of your, uh, uh, your, your mainline theologians today 
will tell you, I, I actually, I went and looked up about the prophecy uh, of John myself, and actually Jesus, it, actually Jesus told him that he would not see death. Uh, and, and, and the problem with that was, it actually said that, it said that Jesus said, you would not see death. The problem with that was, is that John eventually died. So someone said, was that a false prophecy? And so that's the debate. It wasn't a debate whether or not it was said. It was a debate the fact that, what did he mean that he would not see death? The fact that, because we know every man dies at some point. And I really felt like that, uh, God was saying that he will not see death as a mortar, not death as a man. He will not see death as a mortar. But that's here, here again, I'm not trying to be debatable. I just need an understanding. Now, even in that, when I read it, Jesus, Peter had made some statements to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, well, what is it to you if he live until I come? He never said that he was going to do it. He asked Peter. What is it to you? I, I, I wrote it down and I'm trying to find where I wrote it at um, in the scripture in John 70, I think it was John 21, 20 or John 20, when he even said that. And I'm not, again, please, I'm not trying to be argumentative. I just need an understanding and that's all I'm trying to get. Okay, no, no, no problem. Um, I will get back with you so we can move on on that. And maybe while we're still doing this lesson, I can pull that up because I did pull it up. And I looked at it and I said, I, it, it popped up easy for me, but, um, but we'll pull that up again. But the bullying of the, but the bullying of John, I mean, that's, that's pretty much everywhere. Wikipedia, probably it, it, it's, it's pretty much everywhere, but I will mention before I get off tonight, I'm going to mention some sites, online sites that are reputable. You have to uh, make sure that where you're going, because the thing about online, anybody can go online. You can go online and type some stuff up. It doesn't matter. It has to be reputable sites. Uh, most of the sites that go on are highly reputable. They're, uh, they're, most of the professors are from prestigious colleges that I know that are here in America. They are not Jack Lake uh, doctors and, and professors, and but these are highly, uh, and you're gonna, I'm gonna show you a video in a few minutes. Um, about that. Now, based off your homework again, uh, did anyone come up in chapter seven or who those kings were and who those uh, what the what the beast represented? Because I read several of you guys' homework and I didn't really see uh, one person sent me in what was the right answer. I think that was you, uh, uh, Reverend Jackson. I'm not sure whose homework it was right now, but I think it was yours. Where it actually gave the names. Did anyone come up with the name other than they were kings? The, the name of the kings? Yes, the names of the kings, yes. Julius, Augustus, Tiberius, and I don't know how to pronounce this, and Claudius. I forget how, I don't know how to okay, and you, then you, got, you, you got it right. You definitely got it right. Oh, wow. Okay, now I'm going to play a video and, uh, this is one of your most reputable teachings on the book of Revelation that I found. I'm going to share this with you. Someone's, these people coming in late. So hold, hold on, let me see. Can I, somebody's going to have to wait. Uh, okay, hold, hold on just for a second here. Let me. Can everybody hear him? Hold on, hold on, man. Let me. Let no, me. no. I can't can let, let me try. Let me try. Can something hear him? Okay, hold on. Let me try something else. AD 54 to 68, and historians that argue for a date in Nero's time tend to place the writing of Revelation at the end of his reign. In Nero's early years, Okay, hold on for a minute. Um, can anyone hear that now? That's, that's still not... Um, no. Uh, we heard it a few minutes ago, though. Yeah, um... 
Hold on a minute. Uh, what? Okay. Okay, let me try it one more time here. Excuse me, give me a minute. Okay, let me try. Okay, let's try this. Okay. Uh, hitting the landscape very heavily, and then other forces coming in and clearing out buildings. Some fell unnecessarily. There were a number who felt that they were really on the receiving end of this urban renewal project. I'm trying to uh, forward it, fast forward it just a little bit till we can get to um, where I'm trying to go, and I, I think I'm going to. Okay. Roman Emperor to really persecute Christians. Now, how did he do that? Well, we have an ancient historian named Tacitus who tells us that some Christians were um, covered with pitch and burned actually as lamps in Rome. Some were put inside of the skins of wild beasts and fed to the animals. Okay, to I'm, the I'm Christians. Sure back up just a little bit. And in go. that, various forms of torture were employed to try and extract from the Christians an admission that they were behind this. The arguments for dating the book of Revelation during the late years of Nero's reign are based on at least three pieces of information. The first main evidence is John's reference to seven kings. In Revelation chapter 17, John described a scarlet beast with seven heads and ten horns. And in verses 9 through 11, he said that the seven heads represented seven kings. Most interpreters agree that these seven kings were Roman emperors. Julius Caesar is sometimes counted as the first emperor of Rome. He was followed by Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, and Galba. In fact, in Revelation chapter 17 verse 10, we find the detail that the sixth king of Rome was in power when John received his vision and wrote the book of Revelation. This reference has led many interpreters to conclude that John's apocalypse was written during the reign of Nero. A second major argument that John wrote during Nero's reign comes from John... Okay, we're stopping, we're stopping right there. Um, okay, um, there's an, another guy by the name of Domitian. Let me, this thing is still playing. Hold on, let me... Okay, there we go. Okay. Now, um, th th those were, I know, just a quick glimpse, but I want you to find those names again. Okay. Uh, that video is on YouTube. And it says the, it's the first lesson of the study of Revelation. And, it, and if you can't find the word, you can find it on YouTube. And it gives you those names. What's important about those names are it lets us know that that those uh, images that we were saying was Russia and all of that were actually seven kings that were existed during that time. Not today, not the 21st century, dealing with Russia, China, and all that that we said. So God is talking to the seven churches about men that they know people that was causing them to suffer. Nero, who was killed by Nero? Christmas. Paul. Paul was killed by Nero. N Nero was a persecutor of the church, but the church is around Rome. But there was another man that was more uh, furious than, than uh, Nero and, and his name is uh, Domitian. Now, D Domitian, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing, spelling his name right, but it's D-O-M-I-T-I-O-N, Domitian. Now, the reason what the discussion on the video is, is that did John write during the time of Nero or did John write during the time of Domitian? Now, the reason why what you're gonna hear in the video is that most of your uh, theologians believe that John wrote during the time of Domitian. Why? Because that uh, when you look at where those seven churches are at, Nero 
did not go out that far and persecute churches. He only persecuted churches that was near, but it was Domitian that was persecuting churches all over the place. And he was killing them all kinds of ways. Uh, uh, make, uh, they were it, being ate up by lions, that he was boiling them. He was doing everything all over the place. And so therefore, uh, when John wrote his letter concerning their persecution, most theologians feel that it was during the time of uh, uh, Domitian more so than the time of Nero. So around near the end of the first century and not, um, again, closer to the middle of the first century. I'm going to try to let you watch a little bit one more time where they bring up Domitian a little bit because I want you to, because see, we hear Nero, but most have never heard Domitian. Way, way worse than um Okay, let me try, try here written. But history records that the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, two years after Nero's reign ended. So, if the temple was still standing when Revelation was written, it's likely that the book of Revelation was written during the reign of Nero. The third factor that may point to a date in Nero's time is that John wrote during a period of persecution. The book of Revelation frequently mentions the fact that John's readers were suffering. We can see this in Revelation chapter 1 verse 9, chapter 2 verses 9, 10, and 13, chapter 6 verse 9, and chapter 20 verse 4. And as we've already said, Nero was well known for promoting the persecution of Christians. He wasn't the only Roman emperor to do this, but he was the first to do so in a noteworthy manner even if his persecutions were generally limited to the area around Rome. The Roman Emperor Nero, who reigned from 54 to 68, was known to be a pretty brutal emperor. He, he, he also uh, was known to uh, persecute many people in a number of ways. For example, he killed members of his own family. And he was probably the first Roman emperor to really persecute Christians. Now, how did he do that? Well, we have an ancient historian named Tacitus who tells us that some Christians were um, covered with pitch and burned actually as lamps in Rome. Some were put inside of the skins of wild beasts and fed to the animals. And some were also said to, um, to be nailed to crosses. Although there's no specific historical evidence that the persecution under Nero spread beyond Rome to other parts of the empire, this possibility can't be ruled out. So this can also be seen as supporting a date during Nero's reign. But while the arguments favoring a date in Nero's reign have some merit, they aren't entirely convincing. In fact, a number of objections have been raised against them. First, Julius Caesar wasn't actually an emperor. His successor Augustus was the first to claim that title. So Julius Caesar might not be the first of the seven kings mentioned in Revelation chapter 17 verses 9 through 11. Second, as we've seen, Revelation chapter 11 mentions the temple, but John was told in Revelation chapter 11 verses 1 and 2 that all but the outer court of this temple would be protected from the Gentiles. In contrast to this, in Matthew chapter 24 verses 1 and 2, Jesus himself had already predicted that the temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed by the Gentiles. So it's difficult to be sure that Revelation chapter 11 refers to the temple that was destroyed in AD 70. Third, while it's possible that Nero's persecution spread to Asia Minor, there's no historical evidence that it actually did. So, it's difficult to tie John's descriptions of Christian persecution directly to Nero. Because of problems like these, a majority of evangelicals prefer a later date for the book of Revelation. Now that we've looked at the arguments for a date in the days of Nero, let's turn to the evidence suggesting that John wrote the book of Revelation during the reign of Domitian. Scholars who favor a late date for the writing of Revelation tend to place it during the reign of the Roman Emperor Domitian, who ruled from AD 81 to 96. At least four factors can be cited in favor of this date for the writing of Revelation. First, 
Several early church fathers indicated that the book was written at this time. For instance, in his work Against Heresies, Book 5, Chapter 30, Section 3, the early church father Irenaeus reported that Revelation was written toward the end of Domitian's reign. Earlier in this lesson, we mentioned that Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp, who in turn was a disciple of the Apostle John. So, there's good reason to trust his testimony on this matter. This date also concurs with the testimony given by some of the church fathers in the early 2nd century, such as Clement of Alexandria, who implied that John was released from exile upon Domitian's death. A second factor favoring a date in Domitian's reign is the same reference to seven kings that some interpreters use to support a date in Nero's reign. As we've seen, in Revelation chapter 17 verses 9 through 11, John explained that the seven heads on the scarlet beast were seven kings. Those who argue for a date in Domitian's reign argue that all seven kings are presented as severe persecutors of the church. So, rather than counting all the Roman emperors, they count only those emperors who persecuted the church in significant ways. By this reckoning, Caligula was the first emperor. He reigned from AD 37 to 41. Claudius was the second, reigning from AD 41 to 54. Nero was the third, reigning from AD 54 to 68. Following Nero, three minor emperors are ignored because they didn't significantly contribute to the persecution of the church. The fourth emperor that persecuted the church was Vespasian, who reigned from AD 69 to 79. The fifth was Titus, who reigned from AD 79 to 81. And the sixth, during whose reign Revelation would have been written, was Domitian, who ruled from AD 81 to 96. A third factor that points to a date in Domitian's reign is the persecution of Christians. Domitianus was the son of Vespasian and the brother of Titus. Now what you need to know about that is Vespasian and Titus were responsible personally for the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70 and the rooting out of the leadership of early Judaism and the relentless pursuit of Jews all the way to Masada and, and uh, the storming of Masada and the elimination of Jewish zealots en masse in 72 AD. So one of the things that you can say about that family is that they were not very Jewish friendly, to say the least. Uh, so it's not a surprise that Domitianus would be an emperor who would persecute a sect that he would see as sort of a split off from Judaism. Uh, the persecution seems to have been sporadic rather than systematic. Okay, we're going we're to stop that right there. Let me... Um... Okay. Okay, so uh, Domitian, it should be a new name for some of you guys. So uh, if you want to look him up more, that would be good. Um, Apostle CQ, uh, you are right about one of the things you said about the death of John. Okay, uh, about the prophecy. You're right about the prophecy. Do you, uh -oh. you hear me? Yes, Apostle, sir, I hear you. I said you are <laughs> right about the prophecy. Yes, I hear you. Thank you. Okay, you're right. Okay, now about the, the about the boiling of uh, John. Yes, he was. That's everywhere. Uh, okay, now, well, I want you guys to do something. Uh, this is for your homework as well. I want to ask a question. Are those churches still existent today? If they're existing today, I need to know uh, um, where they're at. Are they still in the same and still in the same cities? There is one church I will give you a hint. It's not in existence today. One church actually ended up turning to Muslim. They are no longer Christian. They are they are, they are pretty much um, ninety nine percent Muslim. Mm. So. Your homework is to look up what happened to the other six churches. You can look up all seven. But one church, I'm telling you, turned Muslim.
Any questions, comments, or statements? Dr. Short, I just have a quick uh, question. Um, I remember reading, I thought, in uh, church history, a little bit about Domitian, Domitian, when they talked about Nero in church history. Right. That we studied a couple months ago. Right. He, he probably did, because if you're going to talk yeah. about Nero, you're going to talk about the emperor that came right after him. Which was, and he's more notorious than Nero, but for some reason, Nero has the name. And I think it was because right. of who he killed. And I believe that was, uh, I believe that was Paul, I believe. Yes, yes. Because they talked a little bit about Polycarp. Someone double check Google how did Paul die at whose hands? Before we get off, please. These seven churches were now, if you go back to let's go into your Bibles while or someone's Googling that. Go to verse 11, I believe, of chapter 1 of verse 1 is crucial. Verse 11. Um, verse 11. Let me, I'm looking for it. Okay, he says, I am Alpha and Omega the first and, and the last so what thou seest, write in a book and, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. I mean, this is literary interpretation. Hermeneutics, again, uh, in most of our interpretation, if you take uh, hermeneutics, hermeneutics says that most of the Bible is interpreted literally. So it was sent to those seven churches. God did not tell him to send it to nobody else, or was he? did he actually even mention any reference to anybody else? This is literally interpreted. But we are blessed because of the writing, because of what also what Paul said, that we learn from, we learn from um, the things that are written for time are written for our learning, that to paint us because we might have hope. But G, the scriptures is very clear that it was written to these seven churches. It was important, these seven churches, being the first and early churches had a had uh, their existence was crucial to Christianity. You're gonna find out what happened to most of them. I think most of them survived, but did they all survive? I I believe there was one that I said that became um, that mm -hmm. came, that came down about through Muslims. So, but again, and you can almost see why because over there majority of over there right now is we can say is muslim and not christian so that's not hard uh even though judaism judaism uh the teaching of muslim is greater than judaism over there so one of the churches fell to that but did all the churches fall to that they were all having their problems they were all having issues except for one or two but um when God said, if you do this, I will bless you. If you don't do this, then I will curse you. Did they listen to God? So we know what God said he would do, bless or curse them. What I need you to come back is what happened to the Smyrna church. He told them to do the first words over again. So the question is, did they do it? <laughs> That's the question, did they do it? So we know what he said to all seven churches, but did they take his advice? Uh, you know what? Because of this is so extensive, this will be your only homework, okay? What happened to those seven churches? Did those seven churches take the advice? We know the Philadelphia church, he was he loved and all that. And so, but did they take his advice? He might have gave it, but did they take it? Everybody understand the homework. So please yes. email me and cite your sources. What happened to those seven churches? Are they Catholic sure. now? Mm. Some people will think that they're probably Catholic churches now. But hey, let's find out. Do your research. So we're doing research on seven churches. Um, one is easy because God was quite pleased with one. But we still want to know if it's still in existence today. And how about the one that God says, you know, 
you're you're not hot nor cold, and I feel like spilling you on your mouth. Did, uh, did they make it? Did they ever like go? Oh, you know, uh, we need to get together. We have church. You know, and, and they all had angels. They all had pastors. My God, you know, hmm. and the pastor, and pastor, this is your fault. You allowed us. They all had angels. The Bible right. says that to the angel of the church, to church. the pastor right. of that church. Yes. So it was up to the, the leaders of that church to get it together. He didn't say to the sheep. He wrote to the angels of those churches, the head of the churches. So please educate me next week. What happened on those seven churches? The angels up to the church write. That's something to think about. God is writing to yes. you as a pastor. So he's just not. Oh. He's directing it more so at the pastor. To, I mean, unless in my Bible it says to the angels, it, it also says yeah, to the angels. Yeah, to the angels. Yes, he, he's, he's really going at those angels, those those, <laughs> those, those, those pastors. Yes. Mm -hmm. hey. wow. 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 Dr. Short, may I make a statement before yes. you, we go? Yes. I truly want to thank you, but you sure have my head hurting sometimes. <laughs> and it is hurting now, but thank you so much <laughs> for all of your teaching and all of your studies and everything that you pour into us, all of us, but especially into me. So thank you so much. Well, and one of the things I, I want to say that becoming a, uh, a good teacher, you have to admit when you're wrong. And that's something that I promise you guys, whenever you're right and I disagree and I find I'm wrong, I will not wait and do it properly. I will do it openly. And that's the mark of a great leader. I'm not saying I'm great, but that's what you have to do. If you're going to be a teacher, you want to make sure you can apologize openly. And uh, I can apologize openly and I can rebuke openly too. <laughs> so, but, but yeah, so uh, I have no problem with that. You're, as a teacher, I'm going to say that you're not going to always be right. There is no teacher. Right. I've been under many teachers. You're not going to be right all the time. But you do need to be right most of the time. Uh, I'm saying this because you do need to be right most of the time. If you're a teacher, you, you can't be 50-50. No, nobody's paying class of 50-50. No, you got to be right most of the time. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make you uh, great leaders, great teachers. And um, and so when you leave here, and but the main thing is, is, is stay humble. Know how to say I was wrong. Know how to say I'm sorry. That's, that's the teaching. That's where we really grow, by staying humble. So I love you much. Uh, Dr. Short, before yeah, you leave. Dr. Short. Yes, sir. Um, did I understand you right that you uh you you didn't want us to use certain uh resources? You just oh. I mean, you know. No, huh? I, no, I just want to make sure you double check your resources, um, making sure that you're using reputable people, making sure do if someone's giving you something, see where they're from. Where where did they go to college at? Make sure they, they went to somebody's college. They're just not writing off top of their head. You know, just, you know, because I'm an author too, but I don't put myself out there. I don't want nobody following me like that. But there are some reputable people. And most of the people I try to write behind been writing for 50 years or so. Most of these theologians, they, they pretty much know they're talking about. And I try to, we gonna all have to follow somebody. We all gonna have to follow somebody unless we know it ourselves. And I don't know it like that. So I'm trying to follow great men and women that uh, have gone on before yes. me and they're, and they're recognized among their peers. And most of the time, as you heard the man says, most theologians believe this, most believe that. And the reason why they say that, because you'll find something they don't. And, and some, I don't care what you believe, you're gonna find somebody that totally believes different and they got that right too. But I wanna hear what are the majority of most uh, great theologians saying, and more than likely that's the way I may roll, but I will listen to the other side as well. You wanna listen to both sides, but that's why we're having this Thursday class because the Thursday class is gonna make us learn how to choose which version is right. That's what Thursday night class is about. You got the King James version, NIV, you got all this. But how do you know the King James interpreted right? How do you know this is that is right? That's what Thursday night is all about. That's why we're taking our time with the study in Book of Revelation. We want to get this study right. That's why we haven't moved past chapter three or four yet, because we're going to get this right. God bless you, saints. Love you. 
And <laughs> praise God. Mm. I'll do your homework next week and may uh, let us pr uh, pray our way out. Father, we thank you, God, for this class. We thank you, God, for this awesome lesson, these awesome people. And God, as they go into the homework, God, help them to uh, find what they're looking for. God, help us to go to higher heights and deeper depths. And we pray for those that weren't able to make it on tonight. In Jesus' name, our soul says amen. God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. God bless you. Uh, bless you. Bless you. Have a blessed week. God, 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 God,